September picketh ripest fruit, and gathers in the grapes. Then make new wine, but be aware, it rain and sickness shapes. Then plant the vetch, new crops shall form from thy wide seeding hand. So peas, and show forth sesame, and poppy to the land. As the poem on the calendar page of this month suggests, this month leaves you particularly open to getting sick with a cold, which is exactly why this video is late, so my apologies for that. We start off this month with the Harvest Festival, which is the closest Sunday to the first full moon after the 10th of September. This is the second of the celebrations of this type, which follow on from the celebration of Lammas Day last month. When Lammas Day was the celebration of the harvest of the grain, the more generically named Harvest Festival is the celebration of the gathering in of the fruits and the vegetables. The Abbey normally celebrates this day with a fair held for the local people, and a special service blessing the first fruits brought to the church, sprinkling them with holy water and saying, O most merciful Father, who of thy gracious goodness has heard the devout prayers of thy church, and turned our dearth and scarcity into cheapness and plenty, we give thee humble thanks for this thy special bounty, beseeching thee to bless these fruits, and to continue thy loving kindness unto us, that our land may yield us her fruits of increase, to thy glory and our comfort. A few days later we have Rudmus, or Holy Cross Day, which in our calendar is on the 14th. This commemorates the finding of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem in the year 335 by the mother of the Emperor Constantine, Helena, and is so important in our right as to have its own full processional anthems and commons. O glorious cross, O cross adored, O precious tree, O sign admired, on whom the blood of Christ the Lord, the devil quelled, and life acquired. There is no glory here on earth for man save in this holy tree, the cross which brought us up from dearth, and in its branches set us free. The Empress Helena, now Saint Helena, sent the pieces of the cross that she found to Rome and Constantinople, but also retained some of them in Jerusalem as the foundation of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which you can still go and see today. The reason why this is so important in our calendar is that this is the day that is the dividing line between summer and winter, when work in the field stops, and, at least in monastic communities, a more generous portion of food and sleep is allowed under the winter schedule, which is more geared towards contemplation and study. Another big and exciting thing about this day is that it is shaving day, when, before modern razor blades took hold, monks would get one of their twice yearly shaves. One curious thing that happens in our use four times in a year is the general excommunication, and it happens on what's called ember days. Traditionally, these are days of special prayer and fasting, which are kept on Wednesday, Friday and Saturday following the third Sunday of Advent, the same days following the first Sunday of Lent, after Pentecost, and, as here, after Holy Cross Day. On this day, we are directed to read out in church something called the Commination, or, as the parochial use glosses it, the denunciation of God's anger and judgment against sinners. This is a very dramatic service and includes all of the most exciting bits of fire and brimstone medieval Christianity. The priest stands in the pulpit or in front of the altar with a lit candle and a book of the Gospels, and begins. Good Christian people, it is ordained by the council of all holy church that every man of holy church that hath souls for to keep should show among them four times in the year the articles that be written in the general sentence, that is to say, the points that belong to the great curse of God against impenitent sinners, gathered out of the 7 and 20th chapter of Deuteronomy and other places of the scriptures, and that you should answer to every sentence Amen, to the intent that being admonished of the great indignation of God against sinners, you may the rather be moved to earnest and true repentance, and walk more warily in these dangerous days, fleeing from such vices, for which ye affirm with your own mouths the curse of God to be due. 
and after this, the priest recites a list of sins and anathemas, to which all of the terrified people in the nave reply, Amen. For example, Cursed is he that removeth away the mark of his neighbour's land. Amen. Cursed is he that maketh the blind to go out of his way. Amen. And after this, he says, the general excommunication. Wherefore, by the authority of our Lord God Almighty, and our Lady Saint Mary, and of all heaven, and of the angels and archangels, the patriarchs and prophets, the apostles and evangelists, the martyrs, confessors and virgins, and also by the power of all holy church that our Lord Jesus Christ gave unto St. Peter, we denounce as accursed all those that we have openly reckoned unto you, and all those that maintain them in their sins or give them help or counsel, so that they be separated from God and from all holy church, and so that they have no part in the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, nor any sacrament of Holy Church, nor any participation in the prayer of Christian folk, but that they be accursed of God and Holy Church from the sole of their foot unto the crown of their head, in sleeping and waking, in sitting and standing, and in all their words and works, and unless they have grace of God for to amend their lives, for to dwell in the pains of hell without an end, Fiat, fiat, amen. Then shall the bell be rung, the book of the gospel slammed closed, and the candle be dashed upon the ground. On the 16th, we have St. Edith of Wilton. I have a special place in my heart for St. Edith, mainly because she's from near my home village. She was the daughter of an Anglo-Saxon king, Edgar, who had either abducted or probably more likely run away with her mother, Wilfrida, who was the abbess of the Abbey of Wilton. In any event, her mother returned to the Abbey and raised Edith to be a nun. Edith grew up to be the abbess, where she founded a sort of boarding school for girls. I have to admit I feel a bit sorry for Edith, having her actual mother as the abbess, and I have a feeling that she had a bit of a rebellious streak as a result of it. Edith seems to have dressed fabulously ostentatiously, giving her, taking her mother's injunction that the nuns should wear plain white with a gold band way too far. William of Malmesbury tells us that she wore luxurious golden dresses, and when she was rebuked by Ethelwold, the Bishop of Winchester, for this, she told him that the judgment of God, which alone penetrated through the outward appearance, was alone true and infallible, and that pride may exist under the garb of wretchedness, and a mind may be as pure under these vestments as under your tattered furs. Perhaps she is the patron saint of children whose parents are also teachers, or maybe a major fashion houses. Either way, she was very pious and owes the recognition of her sainthood largely to a vision in which she told of how, when she died, the devil tried to accuse her but that she had beaten him up and smashed his skull in. An extension of the scheduled step change in the year is the lighting of the fires, which happens a couple of days later on St Matthew's Day, the 28th. On this day, it is the custom to clean out the old fireplaces, which, apart from those in the kitchen at least, have lain dormant over the summer season, and to kindle a new blessed fire which will heat the house over the winter. The priest will swing by and bless the hearth by reading Psalm 97. There shall go a fire before him, and burn up his enemies on every side. His lightnings gave shine unto the world, and the earth saw it and was afraid. And then, reading the blessing. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, vouchsafe to bless and sanctify this fire, which we, unworthy as we are, through the invocation of thy only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, presume to bless, and so on. It is the custom, though it's understandably not contained in my parochial use, to toss a piece of raw meat onto this new fire. I've been told that this is to ward off dragons, and until I have a more concrete reason to try and dissuade people from doing it, this seems to be a largely harmless custom. I have known instances, though, where raw meat was taken to mean salami or chorizo. I've got to admit I don't know where this comes from, and it seems like cooking chorizo in the fire is more likely to attract dragons than ward them off. Perhaps this is one of those things best left uninvestigated. 
The month ends with the Feast of Michaelmas. This is my favourite of all of the feasts in the calendar, apart obviously from the ones which are supposed to be my favourite. This is the day that celebrates St Michael and all angels in heaven, but we call this day Goosemas, because by tradition, on this day the abbot entertains all of the people who live and work in the abbey to a slap-up roast dinner of goose to celebrate the end of the agricultural year. By tradition, this is the last day that you should eat berries and nuts directly from the tree, because, as the legend says, this is the day on which Satan fell from heaven, and when he did, he got caught on a blackberry bush and cursed the fruit. My main reason for loving this day, though, is that, like the liturgical nerd I am, I get to sing my hit number one sequence, and because I want for it to speak for itself, I'm going to read it out to you in full. To celebrate thy praise, O King, let all our bands unite, the whole assembly singing hymns this festal day to light. As Michael's service luster gives unto the heavens on high, the ninefold orders of the host as flames around thee fly. Thou didst create the angel forms of thy primeval hand, and in thine image latterly the first of man did stand. Nine orders, each in proper place as we do comprehend, around thy throne do minister and answer thy command. The archangelic phalanx first, the great and mighty powers, the gracious mouth dominions, thrones and high rulers, the seraphim with fiery locks, the cherubim divine, do circling there in highest heaven with brightest radiance shine. Do ye, O Michael, heavenly prince, Gabriel messenger, Raphael once a bondservant to heaven thou us bear. Serve God the Father's bright command by wisdom of the same and co-eternal spirit, one in substance and in fame. Ten thousand times ten thousand, lo, your tending courses fly, there ministering unto the king in palaces on high, that hundredth sheep to hurry back, rejoicing to return the lost tenth piece of silver there, for which the Lord doth yearn. A chosen band, our vows upraise, the harp and lutes to glee, and at the warlike tumult's end, bless Michael's victory, the incense of our prayers accept upon that altar rare. At last, our God may grant us to sing alleluias there. So September draws to an end, and with it we close off and bid farewell to the summer months, and, newly shaved and full of goose, look forward to the end of ordinary time and the coming of the round of the great liturgical feasts that will characterise the next six months. Until next month, beloved listener, may the harvest of your labours be made fruitful of the Lord to his glory and your comfort. May the admirable sign of the shining cross lead you forward through the gloom of the winter months, kindled and warmed by the fire of the prayers of St Matthew. May St Edith inspire your struggle, and may St Michael, the Prince of the Angels, and all of the Archangelic Phalanx, guardians of the heavenly kingdom, guard also this kingdom here below, and all of us evermore. Amen. Thanks for watching. If you like what we're doing, or if you want to help support our mission, please don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope to see you again soon. Benedicat vos, omnipotens Deus. Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen.